السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين uh, Welcome to another episode of the Maradiya Show where we are meeting people where they are I'm your host Shadi Muhammad In today's episode of the Maradiya show, inshallah ta'ala, we'll be continuing our discussion with uh, or about emotional baggage. However, today we're going to be a little bit more solution oriented and we're going to talk about five ways to uh, navigate your emotional baggage. All right. Um, Understand why I said um, navigating your way through the emotional baggage, because sometimes um, the emotional trauma that we've been through, um, we will never, we will never get over it. All right. So it's not about, um, getting rid of your emotional baggage because sometimes, uh, we can't get rid of it. Sometimes we have been traumatized to such a degree that, um, we will never be able to just kind of get rid of it. But what we will be able to do is be more emotionally intelligent. We'll be able to recognize the triggers. We will be able to recognize, you know, the people, places, behaviors that trigger us in a certain way. And we will also be able to, you know, manage our emotions differently instead of making other people responsible for our emotions. That is what emotional intelligence is all about. You taking responsibility for your own emotions and stop making other people responsible for how you feel. All right. Stop making other people. No one else is responsible for how you feel except you. All right. If you are triggered by something, then your job is not to go and attack the person that triggered you. Your job as an emotionally intelligent person is to be able to look at yourself and say, why did that trigger me like this? I don't like the way that made me feel. Why did I feel like that? Why, when this person said this to me or said that to me, why was I triggered like that? What is it? You understand? So this is what emotional intelligence is about. It's not about attacking other people and, you know, bringing other people down because they made you feel like this. It's now turning the attention towards you and asking yourself, why did that behavior, why did that comment trigger me that way? Why is it affecting me that way? Right? Why am I afraid? You know, why am I, you know, why am I feeling anxious? Like, what is triggering these emotions and being able to look deeper within yourself? You guys follow me? That is what emotional intelligence is about. So we talked um, last week about um, emotional baggage. And we said that emotional baggage is the sum of all of the negative experiences that we've had uh, in in the past, whether in relationships, both romantic relationships, platonic relationships, that we bring with us throughout our lives and that these, you know, these emotional, these, um, this baggage is sometimes triggered, you know, by people, sometimes seeing a certain individual triggers you a certain way. Yeah. You guys follow me. Do you ever notice that sometimes seeing a person, seeing someone, it could be an ex-spouse, Right. It could be someone that, you know, you worked for previously, a boss, you know, I mean, an employer. Right. Or a colleague or somebody that gave you a negative experience. Just seeing them causes anxiety. Just seeing them, you know, causes fear. You understand? That is very important. A family member. Yes. Seeing a family member, you know, showing up at a family gathering and you're having anxiety. Right. Allahu Akbar, you used it in your group yesterday, mashallah. That's, and that's what it's all about. I'm just trying to spark the conversation. You guys are intelligent. I would like to think that the people that I'm addressing, the people that I speak to, the people that actually pay attention to what I'm saying are smart, intelligent, brilliant minds. And all I'm doing is just sparking the conversation for you to take the conversation, you know, to your circle and to your constituency and beginning, you know, and, and furthering those conversations. That's it. It doesn't mean that because I'm here that I am more intelligent, that I have more knowledge. That, that does not mean that. Some of you guys are far more intelligent than I am. I don't, I don't profess to be the most intelligent, to be the smartest. You know what I mean? Like, that's not my claim to fame. I don't claim that. 
All right. All I want to do is just, you know, ignite, ignite, you know, the minds that are listening that you can take the conversation a little further. All right. So this is what emotional. So it's certain some sometimes a certain someone, a certain someone triggers you in a certain way. Right. Going to family gatherings. Sometimes you already know, you know, that when I pull up to my grandmother's house, I pull up to my mother's house. You know, it could be a sibling. You know, what I mean, it could be a sibling. That triggers you in such a way that this particular sibling has given you a horrible childhood experience, a horrible childhood experience. And every time you see them, you know, they trigger you in a certain way. All right. Um, places going back to certain places trigger you in a certain way. Myself, I don't go into the prison system. Um, I don't go give dawa to inmates and stuff like that. I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. I hate the smell of prison. I hate the smell walking through the door. I hate the smell. It triggers me. I don't like it. And I didn't have a horrible prison experience. You know what I mean? Like I didn't have like people picking on me and being, but like I didn't, I didn't have that experience. But at the same token, the whole prison industrial complex within itself is traumatizing. It's traumatizing. It wasn't, you know, I met some of the, you know, some, some of the, the most thorough individuals that you could meet. I met some of the, you know, most loyal, confident, brilliant individuals that you could possibly meet within the African-American experience in prison. So my prison experience wasn't horrible from the perspective of the people that I engaged when I was in prison. It's just the complex within itself, the bars, the smell the smell of chlorine and bleach that they use to clean the floor. It's just all of it. It triggers me in a way that I don't like to be triggered. So I personally, I don't go into the prisons. I don't talk to inmates. I don't go back to that environment. I don't. I protect my peace at all costs. <laughs> you understand? I'm not putting myself back in that environment. You know what I'm saying? Like there's brothers and sisters out there, you know, that are far more intelligent and far more capable than I am to go into the prison industrial complex and begin educating those who are incarcerated. As for myself, no, I'm not going to do that. No. So if someone ever wondered, now you know. <laughs> now you know. All right. So people, places, right? And uh, uh, behavior, seeing certain behaviors, right? Seeing certain behaviors from someone. You might be married to your spouse and your spouse may do something a particular behavior that may trigger you because of some traumatic experience that a previous spouse gave you. And you might say to your spouse, listen, don't, you know, don't do that. Don't attack. Don't attack your spouse. You know what I mean? Go back to yourself and ask yourself, why did my spouse trigger me that way? And they triggered you because they triggered you because the behavior you thought you were over, you never got over it. Proof, the person just triggered you. Proof that you didn't get over it is that you got triggered. Your spouse triggered you in a certain way. And some emotional baggage, it lies dormant in our subconscious. You thinking, I'm over this person, I'm ready to get married, I'm ready to go into another you know, relationship. Meanwhile, all of that pain and trauma just sits right there, stored in your subconscious. And the moment the person that you are married to currently does something, says something, immediately they trigger you. Because it's just dormant in your subconscious. And this is why we have to be self-aware. We have to constantly be aware of ourselves. And how the people, places, behaviors, the experiences around us are triggering us. All right? Some of us have anxiety attacks. You, see, you know what I mean? Like we, we, have, we have anxiety attacks at moments that we don't even realize that we are having an anxiety attack. And we may lash out at our spouse, you know, sweating and, you know, we're raising our voice. And at that moment, you got to stop for a second and say, like, what did your spouse do to you? They didn't do anything to you. You misinterpreted a behavior. You misinterpreted an action and automatically you're triggered. You're having a complete anxiety attack and you don't even realize that you're doing it. And you're lashing out at your children, lashing out at your spouse. At that moment, you need to go sit down for a moment. Collect your thoughts. 
and realize that the people that you are attacking are not your enemies. You are your biggest enemy. All right? So we dealt with um, uh, how emotional baggage affects your life. We said that, it, number one, it makes you overprotective of your emotions. All right? You become numb. You numb yourself emotionally. All right? Which doesn't really work out for you in relationships because every relationship has to have some level of, you know, vulnerability have some level of love and some level of, you know, emotional awareness in order for you to thrive in that relationship. No one is just in a relationship because in that case, if you're just emotionally numb in a relationship, can we even call that a relationship? It's not even a relationship. It might be a business relationship. It might be, you know, just a partnership. <laughs> you know, some spouses function like, you know, roommates. Some spouses function like roommates because they're both emotionally numb or one of them is emotionally numb. The other person feels it and is tired of extending themselves to the other person and getting nothing back. Nothing is reciprocated back to them. So they just stop. They stop showing, you know, attention to the person because they realize that this person is numb. The person that I am in a relationship with is completely numb and there's nothing I can do about that. So they stop trying so you become overprotective of your emotions, right? You don't want to be exposed out of fear or shame um, or the belief that someone doesn't understand you, all right? Number two, you start to project your pain on other people, right? This is how emotional baggage affects you. You start to project your pain onto other people, right? You're triggered, and then you take your frustration out on them. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shams al-Din, Allah. All right. So you start to, you know, take your frustration out on, you know, your spouse or the person that is close to you. All right. So you're projecting your pain onto the other person. Hurt people, hurt people. Right. Hurt people, hurt people. Number three, you become indecisive about your decision, your decisions. Right. You invest more energy and time in making simple decisions than you did before because you've simply just lost confidence within yourself. This is how much your emotional baggage has tri triggered you. How it is affecting you is that you've lost confidence within yourself. You have no confidence. So you, you invest more time than what is necessary in making simple decisions. Or even worse, as number four, is that you lose complete trust in yourself. You don't trust yourself anymore. So you put your, the management of your affairs into the hands of someone else. So now you got someone else juggling your affairs, whether it is, you know, your spouse, you go to your spouse and your spouse becomes now your handler. How many of you guys have ever been in a situation where your spouse was your handler instead of just your spouse? Meaning you turned all of your affairs over to your spouse because you had zero trust in yourself. Or your parents, you know, living vicariously through you, right? You put all of your trust in your parents' you know, hands, and now you allow your parents to manage your affairs. Absolutely. Because you have no trust in yourself. You don't even trust yourself no more. Your experience was so traumatizing that you don't have any trust in yourself anymore. So you turn all of your affairs over and put them in the hands of someone else to manage your affairs for you, Right? Absolutely. To distrust yourself is very dangerous because no one knows what's going to how to make you happy. No one knows what you need in life. No one knows what you require better than you. I'm amazed at people who send me emails and say, you know, this is my spiel. This is my whole situation. What do you think I should do, brother? Email? What do you mean? What do you think I should what what I think you should do? What do you think you should do? What do you want to do? And that's what a good marriage counselor does. They put the onus on the shoulders of the individual. So if someone comes to me, I'm, I'm just letting you guys know right now. Number one, I told you before, I don't do marriage counselor counseling. Stop sending me your marriage counseling questions. Stop sending me questions about your marriage that requires you to go see a marriage counselor. What you are looking for is a band-aid or you're looking for permission you're looking for me to tell you it is okay to stay. <laughs> I, that, I, that's not my job to tell you to stay or to tell you to leave. All I'm going to do is ask you, well, what do you want to do?
You know, you understand what I'm saying? That's all I'm going to ask you. Well, what do you want to do? Because ultimately, that decision, whether to stay or to leave, is totally up to you. It's nobody else's choice. You don't, you want to stay, but you are guilty. You feel guilty about staying because you're worried about how people are going to look at you. This person is going to think I'm stupid for staying with this man because he cheated on me. This person is going to think I'm stupid because my wife doesn't respect me. Like, so now um, let me reach out to Imam Shadid and see what he thinks about the situation. To hell with what I think. What do you think? You don't need somebody's permission to stay. If you choose to stay for whatever reason, whether it's financial stability, whether it is, you know, um, security, you know, whatever it is. If you decide to stay, you don't owe anybody an explanation for why you decided to stay. That's your life. You own it. Obviously, you are responsible for, you know, your decisions. But at the same token, you don't owe anybody an explanation for why you decided to stay or why you decided to leave. I don't I don't owe anybody an explanation. This is my life. This is my life. <laughs> what I decide to do with my life is my responsibility, period. And I don't need. Yes, I seek consultation for, you know, to help me sort through everything that is in front of me, not to make my decisions for you. You understand? You guys are using marital counseling in the wrong manner. You're using marriage counseling in the wrong manner. It's not about what I think. The marriage counselor is only there to help you sort through everything that is in front of you. And then you make the final decision based upon what you want, not based upon what I want. Stop Losing trust in yourself. I, I did a lecture some time ago called Five Ways to Build Trust Back Into Yourself. Inshallah, I will post it on, um, it was on the SoundCloud, but uh, I'll post it on the, um, uh, on the podcast, Inshallah. Tada. Five ways, and maybe we'll dissect that next. You know, five ways to rebuild trust in yourself. You know, some of us have, you know, we have been shattered by some of our traumatic experiences to such a degree that we don't even trust ourselves anymore. And the last thing, um, how emotional baggage affects your life is comparing. We begin to compare what our lives would have been like if we had never had the experience to what our lives are like now since we had the experience. And when you begin comparing, you miss all of the lessons. You miss all of the beauty. You miss the collateral beauty in your situation when you start comparing, right? You start to miss, you miss the collateral beauty in, you know, your situation because there's collateral beauty in the situation. There's patience that you learn from that situation. There's tolerance. There's an increase in Iman. There's an increase in, you know, your relationship with God. There's an increase in your relationship with yourself as you begin to deeply, you know, begin to deeply reflect. You know, there's, there's so much collateral beauty in every traumatic situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not place on us more than what we can handle, right? There's two verses in the Quran where Allah speaks to this this particular concept. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا ما آتاها وسيجعل الله بعد عسري يسرا that Allah will not charge or task a soul with more than He has given it the capacity to bear, and Allah will make after difficulty ease. So even though it was traumatic, there's something in that situation that you are going to benefit from that you wouldn't have gotten in any other circumstance. There's something in that situation that you are going to learn, no matter how traumatic it was, there's something that you are going to gain from that situation that you probably couldn't have gotten any way else. There's no other way that you could have gotten the blessing that God gave you. So he gift wraps a lot of his blessings in some of the most traumatic, horrible experiences. Because that's the only way we're going to get it. That's the only way we're going to value the lessons. Look at who you are right now. And I can say for myself personally, I would not be the individual that I am, the confidence, the, you know, the cockiness, everything that makes me who I am right now, I would not be that 
had it not been for some of the traumatic experiences that I have gone through in my life, period. Because you can't get that out of a book. And most of us are not smart enough to pick up on that through, you know, life experiences. So we have to have some, 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 some trauma. We have to have some trauma and embedded in that trauma, sprinkled over that trauma. You got to gift wrap. You got to get through the trauma to get to the core, the blessing that is embedded in the middle of that. And if you are, you know, blessed enough, favored enough to make it to the middle of the core of that and begin to, you know, peel off the layers so that you can actually see the blessing, the collateral beauty that is in it. You know what I mean? Like, it's you're blessed, highly favored. <laughs> you're blessed and highly favored. Right. You, you got to get to the core of it. You got to peel back the layers. And as painful as it is, you know what I mean? Like at the core of that, there's your blessing waiting for you, gift wrapped. But it's gift wrapped in difficulty. Allah tells us in the Quran, you know, he's going to make after difficulty ease. But you got to go through the difficulty. In the ma'al usri, yusra. Indeed, with difficulty, there is ease. But you got to go through the difficulty first. We want the ease without the difficulty. We want the ease without the difficulty. Because we, you know, we see the difficulty as some abstract, unnecessary challenge in our lives that has that serves no greater purpose than to make our lives miserable. That's the way we see challenge. That is the way that we see difficulty in front of us as just some unnecessary challenge that God did. Well, why did God do that to me? I don't understand why that was necessary. God could have just gave me the blessing without giving me all the trauma that come along with it. Because if God would have just gave, given you the blessing without giving you the trauma to go along with it, you wouldn't have valued, you wouldn't have appreciated, and you would have justified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment for your kufr. Kufr is another word for ingratitude. Kufr is another word for ingratitude. So you would have justified, you know what I mean, God's punishment of you had he just given you the blessing without giving you the test to go along with it. You understand? So don't, don't compare yourself. You know, don't allow your emotional baggage to make you start questioning God and why he did this to you. You know what I mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for his creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name is Al-Wadud. Al-Wadud, the loving. You understand? The loving. Al-Wadud is only mentioned twice in the Quran. وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودِ ذُو الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ ذُو الْعَرْشِ الْكَرِيمِ Like, he doesn't, uh, he loves his creation. Out of all of the 6,000 and some odd ayats in the Quran, Al-Wadud is only mentioned twice. You got to sift through the Quran to find God's love. You got to find it. You got to find it. <laughs> Meanwhile, mercy, Ar-Rahman, Rahma, is mentioned many times in the Quran, but Al-Wadud only twice. Allah's love only mentioned twice in the Quran. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love is embedded. It's embedded. You got to sift and find it. As for his mercy, his mercy is everywhere. As for his love, his love, you got to sift through it and find it. You got to find that. That's not given to everybody. All right. So let's move on. So let's talk about five tips to help us navigate through our emotional baggage. All right. All right. Okay. You guys ready? Hope you guys are taking notes and I want you guys to begin practically implementing these things. This is this is practical implementation. All right. This is not a lecture. I, what I'm doing is not lecturing. I'm giving you tools, practical tools that you can use right now. All right. So number one uh, from the tools or the tips that will help you navigate your way through your emotional baggage um, it may possibly help you to get rid of it at some point, but I, I can't guarantee getting rid of it. But what I can guarantee is that if you begin implementing these things, inshallah, they'll begin working for you. 
right? Number one is to acknowledge. The first step in dealing with any traumatic experience is to acknowledge the pain that was the result of it. Half of the cure of any disease is acknowledging the sickness first. You got to acknowledge that you are in pain. No matter how much we put on our armor every day we wake up, especially you sisters, especially you women. Right. You put on your superwoman suit. You put on your mask. You try to hide all of that pain. You come to the sit down with your makeup on. You got your, your overgarment on. You got your nice, you know, you got your good clothes on. You know what I mean? You got your you got your good clothes on. And you come out in front of the world and you sit across from the brother at that table and you got your mask on. And you're hoping that this man does not see, does not see through your mask, cannot see through your body armor, all of the emotional scars, all of the pain and the trauma and all of what you have been through. You're hoping that he does not see through that. So you put on your mask, you know, you put on your armor and you come in front and you, inshallah, mashallah, I just want a good brother. The reason why you want a good brother, some of the reason why you want a good brother is so that he doesn't trigger all of that pain that, you, that you're holding in. You just want somebody that you can coast. You can put your marriage on airplane mode and just coast through the marriage and you never have to take off that armor and show him who you really are. Oh, man. You got to lead with your pain. I own that. I own it. You ain't got to express to the person, hey, you know, I've been traumatized because sometimes men play on that. But what you do have to do with yourself is you have to look at yourself in the mirror and own every single piece of who you are. It's all me. The pain, the hurt, the trauma, everything. It's all me. It's all me. Because if you cannot acknowledge that you are in pain, if you can't acknowledge your truth, how can you expect somebody else to appreciate and acknowledge your truth? If you don't love you, how can you force somebody else to love you? you and love starts with you first. <laughs> love starts with you first. When you love you, when you acknowledge your, your pain, you acknowledge that, then it, it opens the door for other people to acknowledge that and respect that. But, you know, we're so busy trying to be perfect in the Islamic community, and it kills me. It kills me because ain't none of us perfect. None of us. And if we would just own our own, you know what I mean? If we would just own our own stuff and stop coming in front of the Muslim community like we're perfect. Perfection is a farce. It's a farce. It's not real. All these Islamic posts on Instagram and, you know, uh, inshallah, fearing Allah, like, no, none of us fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, if you knew what I knew, you would laugh less and cry more. I don't see any of us crying more. <laughs> so this whole idea, I'm trying to fear Allah, I'm fearing Allah, it's a farce. Just own your stuff. Anytime, let me just give you guys a quick tip. Anytime somebody comes to a sit down, anytime somebody comes to a meeting and they come off, they lead with how Islamic they are. They lead with how righteous and how pious and God fearing they are. Run. Run. Run and run fast. You get out of there and you get out of there fast. Because it's a lie. And you got, we got to be old enough to see through the bullcrap. And the person sits down at the sit down and says to you, listen, I'm not even going to, you know, I make my five salat. I'm not perfect. You know what I mean? I, I have my, you know what I mean? I have my issues. You know what I mean? And I'm looking for someone that, you know, I can build with, someone that I can heal with. Because I know that the person sitting on the other end of that table during that sit down has been through pain themselves. You understand? 
And I'm just looking for somebody that we can, we can heal together. You understand? We can heal together. But I'm not perfect. If you're looking for Aisha, Khadija, you're looking for that, please do me a favor, do yourself a favor, and let's just cancel this right now, and hopefully you'll find your Khadija, your Aisha, hopefully you'll find your, you know, your Abu Bakr and your Umar, because I'm not that person. I'm not that person. I'm just being honest with you. But we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to just be critically honest about our, ourselves. We don't. You know what I mean? We don't. We come to the, you know, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that. We're practicing our speeches before we get to the sit down. We're practicing what we're going to say to the person to try to win the person over in hopes that the person will never see us for who we really are. And understand something. When the smoke clears, when the drugs wear off, when the dopamine work wears off, the person will for sure see you for who you are. Understand. When the honeymoon phase is over with, the person with, with, without a doubt will see you for who you are. There is no hiding that. There is no, there is no hiding that. So the person is going to see you for who you are regardless. <laughs> you know? So number one for dealing with, you know, your emotional baggage is to acknowledge that you are in pain. Just acknowledge that you are in pain. That's the first step. The scholars say that recognizing your sickness is half of your cure. <laughs> right, there's beauty and vulnerability and pain. Yes, very much. That is what allows us to love people and for people to love us because you let your walls down, right? Love is the greatest vulnerability. Love is the greatest vulnerability. Uh, obviously, you can't be vulnerable with everybody. So you have to be cautious. Obviously, you should be cautious. But at the same token, you can't keep a wall up in hopes that the person will never be able to see over the wall. You know what I mean? Then that means that the person is falling in love with the mask that you created and will never actually get a chance to know the person behind the mask. So, number one, you have to acknowledge the first step in dealing with any traumatic experience is that you have to acknowledge that you are in pain. You got to acknowledge that, you know, the pain that, you know, is the cause of <laughs> you're talking about work that many really weren't, weren't ready for. Right. Exactly. But we got to start somewhere. We, we have to start somewhere. You know, what I mean, we, we have to start somewhere. And then there's no there's no better time than 2019. 2019 is coming to an end. We're already at the seventh month in 2019. We're going into 2020 in a few months. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, the time is now. In the Islamic community, the time is now, man. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful when I go out and I'm, I'm meeting people and they're like, yeah, I heard you, you know, your periscope. And they're using the language. They, the language is key because language shapes culture. So when I start seeing people talk about triggers and I saw people talking about emotional intelligence and I saw I run into people and they say, like, listen, even non-Muslims, let me be honest with you. Sometimes I'm in Whole Foods, I'm somewhere out and about and I run into people who are not even Muslim. And they're like, yo, I, I listen to your periscope, like, yo, I rock with you, like, yo, the things that you talk about, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, absolutely, that's dope. That's dope. Let's keep let's keep the conversations going. And that way we can all heal. At least, at the very least, we can be aware of, you know, our pain and trauma. Healing, that's on an individual basis. I can't heal you. But what I can do is bring your pain to your attention. Right? Why do I over-exaggerate passion when I speak? I don't understand how you over-exaggerate passion. I'm just a passionate person. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, that's just me, period. I'm not over-exaggerating. It's not, you know, it's not contrived. <laughs> it's not contrived. All right, so. All right, so. Let's just block him. Okay. All right, 
So if you're a distraction, you're, you got to go. I'm sorry. Um, so number one is to acknowledge. Number two is to accept. Accept. Accept the fact that you cannot change the situation. Accept the fact that you cannot change the situation. No matter how much you resent the person, no matter how much you refuse to forgive the other person, it will not change the pain that they have caused you. You can hate the person all you want. That is not going to change your situation. <laughs> this person did this to me. He divorced me or she played me. She cheated on me. This one did this to me. This one did that to me. You can, you can hate the person all you want. It's not going to change the pain that they caused you. You have to accept that this person got it off on you. They got it off. Nobody, nobody is exempt from that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was watching over the situation. He allowed the situation to happen for wisdom that sometimes is beyond what we can fathom, beyond what we can understand. Sometimes we're sitting back and we're saying, well, if Allah is my wali, if Allah is my guardian, if Allah is my protector, if he's my mola, if he's my wali, if he's my guardian, he's my protector, why? And he's the all aware, all knowledgeable, all seeing. Why did he let this person do this to me? Why did he let this person, you know, swindle me? Why did he let this person deceive me? Why did he let this person do this to me? For wisdom that is beyond what you can understand. Wisdom that is beyond what you can understand. The only thing that you can do is ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you accept his qadr, his divine decree, and to allow you to have some insight into his wisdom. Oh Allah, grant me wisdom to understand, you know, I mean, think about Musa and Khidr, right? You think about the story of Musa and Khidr. We're not even talking about God's wisdom. We're talking about the wisdom of another human being. <laughs> the wisdom of another human being. Inspired, divinely inspired by God. However, nonetheless, the wisdom of another human being. We're not even talking about Allah's wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Khidr to Musa. Khidr did some things in front of Musa, Musa could not make sense of. They were riding in a boat, there were other boats on the water, and Khidr poked holes in the boats to drown the boats, sink the boats. Musa's like, what are you doing, man? Khidr like, listen, I told you at the beginning I'm going to do some things that you're not going to be able to understand. You're never going to be able to have patience with the things that you see me do. My wisdom is beyond your ability to fathom. This is a human being. He saw a young man. He killed the boy. Killed the young boy. Musa's like, You have done something egregious. How could you kill a kid? You've killed a, a, a soul. A righteous soul without do right. You have done something egregious. Khidr turned around again and said, didn't I tell you I was going to do some things that you were not going to be able to understand? And then the last time, you know, he saw the wall, you know, falling down. He built the wall up. Musa's like, we can get some money for it. We can get compensation for it. Khidr's like, I don't, I don't need compensation for it. And then, you know, Musa's excessive questioning Cause Hither to say to him, Had the Firaqo Bini Wabainik, this is where we gotta go our separate ways. Cause you're gonna keep asking me. I gotta keep explaining to you everything that I do, right? This is how you know that you need to kind of distance yourself from certain friends. If I gotta explain to you every single move that I make, and I gotta, you know, have a debate with you about every single decision that I make, that means that we are on two totally different trajectories. And I cannot stop what I'm doing. I can't put my life on pause to take time out and explain to you why I'm making this investment, why I'm making this move. Why I'm, and I, 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 don't, I don't have time to do that. We have to go our separate ways. Clearly, we're on two totally different paths. All right? And then the Khidr began to explain to Musa why he did what he did. But Musa would have never been able to figure out why Khidr did the things that he did if, if he didn't take the time out to explain it to him. And this is the wisdom of another human being. What about the wisdom of God? <laughs> you can't even process what you see other people doing that has wisdom in it. 
let alone why God chooses to allow certain things to happen to us. It's beyond your ability to understand. But you trust God. We trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We trust God that he has our best interests at heart. If you don't trust God so much so that you question him about why he does what he does, then that says a lot about you and your belief in him. If you trust God, then the only thing that you want is to, for him to grant you a window into his wisdom. Just grant me access to understand why. I'm not questioning God. I just want to know his wisdom and why he allowed this to happen to me. Because I'm sure there's wisdom in it. Allah is al-Hakim. Allah was al-Hakim. Allah was the wise before mankind was created. Allah's attributes, names and attributes are not contingent on the existence of human beings. Allah was knowledgeable. He was wise. He was the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-hearing before there was anything to see, anything to hear, anything to be aware of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qualities and characteristics are not contingent on the human existence. Understand, that is Aqidah 101. He had these qualities before we were brought into existence, and even after we are long gone, he will still be the all-wise, the all-seeing, the all-hearing, the all-knowing, even after we are long gone from this earth. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, and put your trust in the one that is ever living and he never dies. Meaning, don't put your trust in man. Man is going to die. <laughs> man is going to die. Human beings are going to perish. Put your trust in the one that is ever living that will never die. And he re-emphasized ever living because he said never die. If you say someone is, as you say something is ever living, it automatically implies that it will never die. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re-emphasized that because as human beings, sometimes we need that re-emphasis because we're so weak. <laughs> we're so weak. So Allah says, put your trust in the one that is ever living that will never die. Re-emphasize that. He didn't, that's a, this is the balagha. This is the eloquence of the Quran. Allah didn't have to say we'll never die because ever living, it already implies. It's already implied. This is the balagha. This is the, you know, the eloquence of the Quran. And put your trust in the one that is ever living will never die. Don't, meaning don't put your trust in someone that will eventually perish. That means that your resources are limited. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God's resources are not limited. <laughs> you guys following me? Or did I lose you somewhere? All right. So number two for dealing with our emotional baggage is that we have to accept the fact that we cannot change what someone did to us. I can't change, you know, my life. I can't change you know, what someone did to us. And no matter how much I resent them, it's not going to change what they did to me. It's not going to change what they did to me. I told you guys before, I was raised in a foster home. And my foster mother, as well as my the foster father, was even worse, was very abusive, physically abusive, traumatized. You understand? And no matter how much I resented them throughout my teenage years, I eventually came to the point of realizing that no matter how much I hate them for how they treated me, that is never going to change the trauma that they caused me. I have to deal with that. I have to live with me. I have to just accept that that was my experience. That was my experience. And hating them or resenting them is not going to change the experience that they gave me. So I have to first learn to acknowledge that I am in pain. Number two, I have to accept my experience. Accept your experience. It's yours. They gave it to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? For whatever reason, Allah allowed that to happen. They gave you that horrible experience and it's yours. You own it. Accept it. Accept that the pain, no matter how much you hate the person, no matter how much you resent the person, no matter how much you, you know, you feel about the person, the person, the man divorced you. He divorced you without a legitimate reason. He divorced you while you was pregnant. He divorced you. He cheated on you. He, all of the things, the horrible things that go on in our communities. 
you hate him, you resent him. That's not going to change the pain that he caused you. He dropped the package off at your door and you're stuck with it. Now you got to unravel the package. You got to look inside of it and you got to figure out how to put it together. You got to figure out how to fix it. It's like someone drops a, you know, a raggedy car, you know, just takes a tow truck and just drops it off in front of you, you know, and you got to fix it. <laughs> you have to fix it. That's the experience that they gave you. And then you taking your time out, you know, after you begin to accept that, you accept that that's what it is. That's the car. That's the, you know, raggedy vehicle that this person left on my lawn. All right. Now I got to accept that. I got to I got to fix it. Because me hating the fact that they had the luxury of just dropping that off on my lawn, that's not going to make the car disappear. <laughs> it's not going to make it go away. Some of us walk around with resentment, and resentment is baggage. That's part of your emotional baggage. Do you understand that? Part of your emotional baggage is resentment. You resent this person. You resent that person. Meanwhile, the person has moved on living their best life. While you still sitting here every single day, boggled down with your resentment, holding you down, anchoring you to this particular place that you can't seem to get out of. I, I made uh, I gave a lecture some time ago. I said the pain is real. The box is an illusion. The pain is real. The box is an illusion. What do I mean by that? The pain that someone caused you, that's real. Don't let nobody take that away from you. You're in pain. Don't let nobody make you see it any different than what it is. Don't let nobody come and try to pour sugar over your situation to sweeten it up for you. No, I am in pain. The person caused me pain. Don't let nobody come along and make you see it for other than what it is. It's pain. It's your experience. However, the box that you put yourself in is an illusion. It's not real. It's a figment of your imagination because you don't have to stay in that box. You have two choices with your resentment. You can either wallow in it and allow that to anchor you to that situation for the rest of your life, or you can, you can use that to propel you, to push you forward. You can use the pain to be a catalyst for your success. And the greatest example of that is the story of Prophet Yusuf. Look what his brothers did to him. Even as he sat on the throne as the, you know, the, the one that is in charge of the wealth of Egypt, <laughs> you understand? They still lied on him, even in his face. What did they say when Benjamin, when, you know, he did the, the thing with the cup and he put it in Benjamin's, you know, a bag and he found it and they approached the brothers about stealing. And then they, and they said to Yusuf, now mind you, they're talking to their own brother. They don't even realize that who they're talking to is their brother, right? Who they threw away and discarded and sold for a cheap price years ago. And even right now, up to this moment, they're still lying on him. They say, in That if he stole, If he stole, he had a brother before that stole too. And they're talking about Yusuf. All the way up until right then. You would think after you done did something dirty to someone, that time would heal the wounds and the person would feel remorse and sorry for what they did to you. Some people never feel sorry. Some people never feel remorse for what they do. Stop hoping and wishing that one day the person come back and apologizes to you for what they did, apologizes to you for how they treated you. Don't expect that. Some people... You know, are sociopaths. They don't. They have no feelings at all. They don't feel anything. Life is for the taking for them. They feel absolutely nothing. So you sitting around waiting for this person to come and apologize. You know, waiting with bated breath for this person to apologize to you to tell you they're sorry for how they're never going to do that. Yusuf's brothers, all the way up until that very moment, while he was the king of Egypt at that time, still lied on him. They never felt any remorse for what they did. You know what I mean? So you, you have to just accept that this is the this is the trauma that you caused me. And and I accept that. It's mine now. You know what I mean? You were the you know, you were the cause of it. 
And, but it's my trauma now. It's my pain now. And I have to manage that. So the first way of dealing with emotional baggage is to acknowledge that you are in pain, that you have emotional baggage. Number two is to accept the fact that this is your experience. This is the experience the person gave to you. And there's nothing that you can do to change that as it relates to you hating that person. You have to begin now doing, you know, personal inventory of yourself and begin sifting through your triggers, your emotions, and all of the trauma that the person left you with. That now becomes your task. But you can't just sit there, lock all of your trauma and pain in a box and lock it there and say, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to guard this, you know, box with all my pain and trauma in it and I'm going to hate this person until they come back and apologize to me and then I'll unlock that box and I'll begin sifting through. Like, yeah. You'll be in your grave wishing that you had to just ignored that and lived your best life. You know what I mean? Because some of that resentment, it prevents you from actually practicing Islam. Do you know that? Resentment is so deep that it actually stops you from doing anything positive. You become, sometimes you become narcissistic in that, in the deeper levels of your resentment, you become narcissistic. You ever talk to someone and then in the middle of the conversation, they switch the conversation around to how somebody caused them some pain and trauma and they're just like, but the conversation wasn't even about you. How did you switch? So everything now, all of the conversation always goes back to the pain that somebody caused them, something somebody did to them. You become narcissistic in your own resentment. And obviously you're not going to grow emotionally. A narcissist does not grow emotionally. <laughs> they they have an arrested development. They still stuck at that same place, you know? So it's important for us to accept the fact that we cannot change, you know, the situation, no matter how much we resent the person, no matter how much we refuse to forgive the person, it does not change the pain that they've caused us. Number three, from getting rid of your emotional baggage or managing your emotional baggage is to process the hurt. Use the discomforts of the situation. All right to take a deeper look at yourself. Use how uncomfortable the situation makes you feel to begin looking deeper within yourself. If you constantly play the victim in each failed relationship, in each situation, we will never take ownership of the part that we played in it. Right, or because they were deeply hurt, they feel entitled. Right. To a certain type of treatment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mason. Absolutely. And that's part of being a narcissist. You now start to feel entitled. You're so deeply wounded that you start to feel entitled to a certain type of treatment because this person did this to you or that person did that to you. No one owes you anything. Whatever you get in life is because of what you go after, what you demand, what you request. You understand? Nobody's going to give you anything. When you go fill out for a job application, your boss is not going to say, hey, you're Muslim, right? Yeah, you got to go to Juma, so we're going to give you an hour, right? You know, no, if you don't say anything, your boss is not going to say anything. You understand? The only thing that you get in life is what you demand. You can't go in a relationship expecting that your spouse is going to treat you like the queen or king you believe that you are. No. When does that happen? When you demand. <laughs> these are my values. These are my standards. And I demand. <laughs> I demand that you give me what I believe I am deserving. And even when the person cannot give you everything you believe you deserve, then you assist them in giving you what you believe you deserve. I need to help you help me. <laughs> you understand because you think I'm playing. I'm not joking. I'm telling you that this is what I need in this situation. So I'm going to help you help me. I'm going to help you give me what I believe I need if you, if you can't give it to me. But you got to process the hurt. You got to use the discomforts of the situation to take a deeper look at yourself. You understand? If we constantly play the victim role, right, we will never take ownership of the part that we played in it. 
In any failed relationship, there was two players in that situation. I don't care if it was a friendship. I don't care if it was a companionship. I don't care if it was a relationship. I don't care if it was a marriage. I don't care what situation. There were two people in that situation. No one person shares all the blame in that situation. No one person carries everything. Because even if you believe that, then when do you ever take stop and take a look at yourself? <laughs> because you're going to go into another relationship with the same mindset that it's somebody else's fault. And you bounce from relationship to relationship to relationship, always blaming someone else for how you feel or for what, you know, your disgruntlement, um, how you feel, you know, in the situation. Like you never take any ownership. Even if a person mistreated you in a relationship, do you think that you played just a little, just a little role in that? Even if the person was abusive to you, verbally abusive, you know, even physically abusive. Because before physical abuse starts, there are signs. There are signs to that. The person didn't just start off in the beginning of the relationship hitting on you. And I'm not, I'm not justifying that. I'm just saying that what were you doing when you saw these signs? Why did you decide to stay? And, and I mean, like, I can't answer that for anybody. Only the person can answer that. But I'm sure after the situation is over with, if you took an honest look at yourself, you saw signs of that before you got involved. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a fork in the road and you chose, you made a conscious decision to stay for whatever reason, whether it was for children, whether it was for financial you know, um, stability, whether it was for security, whatever the case may be, you chose to stay, but there was always a fork in the road. You always have a choice. Nobody can ever say, I didn't have a choice in the matter. You had a choice. You had a choice. You chose to stay in the situation for whatever reason. I'm not blaming or finding fault. I'm just holding up a mirror to honest people to say, hey, when you saw signs of the abuse, what did you do? Did you make, you know, a concerted effort to try to change that situation? Did you, you know, decide to make a decision? You know what I mean? What did you do? We give people permission to treat us the way that they treat us. The first time he raised his voice at you, how did you respond to that? Did you say, hey, listen, listen, let me tell you something. I'm not used to men raising their voice at me, shouting at me, using profanity when they talk to me. That, that, that's not going to work. You understand? Men know who to do that stuff to and who they can't do it to. We know. Just like we know we're master manipulators as children. We run circles around our mother, but then when our father come home, we straighten right up. You understand? We, do, we take that same mentality into adulthood. We're not stupid. We know that we can get away with certain things with mom that we can't get away with with dad. And we know that there are certain things that we can get away with with dad if we have a passive father, right, that we can't get away with with mom. We know this as children. Children are master manipulators. Master manipulators. So they know. Boys know at a young age the type of women that we can get away with stuff with and the type of women we cannot get away with. We know. And so, you know, we have to process the hurt, the pain, the discomforts. The Prophet Wasallam, just to give you, you know, some, you know, Islamic context, the Prophet Wasallam said, لا يلده مؤمن في جحر مرتين. The believer does not get stung in the same hole twice. Meaning the pain from the sting causes the believer to reflect about the mistake that was made and not to recidivate, not to repeat the mistake again. So much wisdom in the Prophet ﷺ statement. The believer does not get stung in the same hole twice. Meaning the pain from the sting is enough to make you reflect on the mistake that you made so that you do not repeat the mistake again. So there's a process there. Processing the hurt, using the discomforts of the situation to take a deeper look at yourself. 
Yeah, I'm sorry it froze. I don't know why. All right, you, you guys follow me. That, does that make sense? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi statement, the believer does not get stung in the same hole twice, meaning the pain from the sting causes the believer to reflect on his actions, her actions, so they don't repeat the same mistake again. So there has to be process. There's a process. Process the hurt. Use the discomfort from the situation to take a deeper look at yourself. If you are in pain right now, you are in pain because you're going through a divorce, your wife asked for a khula, you, you know what I mean, like you, she took the children, whatever pain you are experiencing right now, use that pain to propel you forward. Use that pain to help you never create, never to create a situation like that again so that you feel that pain again. If you don't like the way you feel right now, then begin doing your due diligence to make sure that you never end up in a situation like that again. And saying, I'm not getting married anymore, that's not the solution. That's just a cop out. That's an easy way of saying, I don't want to deal with my issues. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not getting married anymore. What? Just because you're not getting married anymore doesn't mean you're not going to have any more relationships. We still got needs. Sexual, emotional, otherwise, we still got needs. So when you say, I'm not getting married anymore, all you have done is solidified in your mind that now Xena, fornication or adultery, has now become an option for you. Do you understand what you're doing to yourself? When you say, I'm not getting married anymore, that doesn't mean that you're not going in, you're not going to entertain a relationship you know, provided one presents itself to you. That doesn't mean that you're not going to go into a relationship anymore. You understand? So stop saying, I'm not getting married no more. I'm done with marriage. That means when you say I'm done with marriage, that does not equate to I am done with relationships, which means when you say I am done with marriage, especially for younger people, right? What you are doing is that you are now solidifying in your mind that Xena is now an option for you. And you justify that. You justify that by your your pain. <laughs> you justify that by your pain. Allah knows my situation. I don't ever want to go through that again. So you're going to avoid the commitment of marriage, right? The tradition of marriage. And you're going to now relegate yourself to these, you know, quick transient relationships that involve no commitment that is haram from beginning to end, right? Right? Based upon the fact that you were in pain, somebody put you in a painful situation. I mean, you know, to each his own. But if that's what you're telling yourself, that I'm done with marriage, un, uh, let me translate that for you. Let me translate what that means. That means that I am done with the commitment to an individual following the Islamic protocol. That does not mean that you are done with relationships. So what you are now doing is that you have now accepted fornication and adultery as justifiable in your eyes. Tell me I'm lying. Tell me I'm lying to the brothers and sisters who have said that, who have fallen into adultery, because for you it's adultery. If you've been married before and you go and engage in a relationship with someone and it's, you know, there's a sexual you know, connection there. Um, for you, it's adultery. For the other person, it might be fornication because maybe they were never married before. But you were married before. You had the marital experience before. So for you, it's adultery. I, I just want to, you know, I just want to clarify some things for you. You have now made one of the most despicable sins, one of the seven great sins not just in Islam, but even in Christianity, you have now accepted one of the seven deadly sins, the seven major sins, and pretty much just about every religion, you know, every God revealed divine religion, right? You have now accepted that as being okay. Once you've been married before, you can never engage in that because for you, it's adultery. I, I just want you to understand that. For you, it's adultery. For the other person, it might just be fornication. 
But for you, you've been married before. You've experienced marriage before. It's adultery. And some people, you know, have, you know, Muslims have engaged in adultery on many occasions, man. Don't you know the, the you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took a walk through the hellfire? Right? The angels took the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on a journey through the hellfire. You guys familiar with this hadith? Authentic hadith. The angels took Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on a journey through the hellfire. And as the Prophet Sallallahu is making his way through the hellfire, he's seeing certain people being punished in certain ways. So he comes to, you know, um, a group of people that are in like this huge, in Arabic it's called a forum, and, and a huge stove or oven, right? And at the bottom of that oven is just flames, right? Flames at the bottom. And inside that oven, there's naked men and women being scorched by that flame. And every time they climb up to the top, there's an angel waiting there at the top of that oven. And he takes a stick and he pushes them back in, right, until they fall back down to the bottom. And then the fire is so hot, so scorching hot, they're literally climbing out the, the stove until the angel pushes them back in. And this keeps happening over and over again. And the Prophet ﷺ turns to the angel and he says, what was their sin? What did they do? What did they do? The, prophet, the angel says, these were the people who in the earth, they, was, they, were, um, they were fornicating and committing adultery in, in the life of this world. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, as I said before, fornication and adultery has different levels, right? And, as a, and, and you can tell that the fire is scorching them and they can feel that they're trying to climb out. Like the fire is so hot at the bottom of that oven that they're trying to climb out. And every time they get to the top, they, they get pushed right back in until they fall down to the bottom. And they're all being scorched in that fire together, right? And these are the people... That and keep in mind that they're naked in this fire being burnt together, and it's just you know, uh, as Allah says in the Quran, with jaza and bifaqa, it's an appropriate punishment because these were the same people you were naked with underneath the covers in this life. You got naked, you had sexual relations with this person, that same person that you had sexual relations with. If God does not forgive you, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive you, that's the same naked person you are going to be scorched with. In the hellfire. So take a good look at the person that you are sacrificing your paradise for. And understand that this same person that you're sleeping with, for you it's adultery. Even if you are divorced. Even if you are divorced. If you've ever experienced marriage before, then for you to sleep with someone that is not your spouse anytime after that, it is considered adultery. Go back to the books of fiqh and understand what this term zina means. You guys use terminologies. You have absolutely no clue what you're talking about. I'm trying to make this as real for you as I possibly can. And perhaps the reminder, ten fa'ul mu'minin, will benefit those who believe. Adultery is worse than zina, yes. Zina is someone who has never been married before, not married, and they go and they commit, you know, fornication. How do we know that adultery is worse than uh, fornication? Because of the punishments. The punishments are different. For the person who commits fornication, never been married before, the punishment for them in Islam is to be lashed, to be whooped a hundred times. The punishment for adultery is to be stoned to death. Why? Because adultery causes more harm. It destroys the family unit. It, you know, mean like it creates, you know, it, it destroys families. Fornication might not necessarily destroy a family, but adultery most certainly will destroy a family. Whether man or woman. Adultery doesn't just destroy the family of the person who did it, but it destroys the other family. In Saudi Arabia and in other parts of the Eastern world, they have something called honor killings. Honor killings, right? 
where a girl may sleep. And, and the, the, the thing, the weird thing about honor killings is that it's only when the girl does it. That's the double standard in the Arab world, right? Not just the Arab world, because in Pakistani culture and in, in South Asian culture, they do the same thing as well. They have what's called honor killings. And it's only when a girl does it <laughs> because she's bringing shame on the family. Meanwhile, the boy can go out and sleep with as many women as they want to. And there's never any shame brought on the family. So as long as the at the Nihaya, at the end of his sexual ex escapade, he ends up marrying a good girl and then, you know, lives happily ever after. Meanwhile, the daughter, you know, she gets one mistake, right? If, if the girl, you know, sleeps with a boy and the family finds out about it, then the oldest brother or the older brother of that sister will kill his sister and in some instances kill the man that she slept with. Right. Right. There's nothing honorable about double standards. Right. Right. This is something that's very popular in Saudi Arabia. Very popular. When I was living in Saudi Arabia, there were a number of situations. There was a very popular, very famous situation of a girl who was in prison for killing a guy who tried to rape her and you know she was put in prison and she sat in prison for about seven years until you know the tribes figured out you know what they were going to do with the situation it's just like but he tried to rape her why should she even be in jail to begin with you know what i mean but nonetheless um so that's honor killings that you brought shame on your entire family so that the, the boy would go kill his sister and in some instances kill the boy that she slept with and then die for it because that's where the honor comes in. Because when the court find out that the younger brother did it, they're going to hang him. They're going to kill him. But he dies with honor because he dies killing, having killed his sister for putting shame on the entire family. This is a real thing. Understand how Asian culture works. This is a real thing. <laughs> and obviously, this has nothing to do with Islam. This is culture. All right. This has nothing to do with the religion of Islam. The religion of Islam doesn't sanction any individual taking it upon themselves to, you know, uh, extract retribution or to, you know, unless it's in the case of self-defense. But other than that, there's no way that Islam sanctions someone going and carrying out an Islamic perceived Islamic punishment on someone. You know, but the point that I'm making is that, you know, um, the girl she's killed, the boy who she did it with is killed. The son is killed. The two families might still even be feuding with one another, even after all of that is done, all as a result of fornication and adultery. All as a result of fornication and adultery. So we, we really don't understand how horrible, how heinous, you know, this crime is. And to see so many Muslims here in America engaging in this behavior without, you know, Without, without any fear of divine repercussion or you know social repercussion, it's it's just really sad. It just speaks volumes to the privilege that we have living in this country, you know, and to be able to call ourselves Muslims, you know, to be able to call ourselves Muslims, you know. What I mean, meanwhile you're engaging, you know. What I mean, like there was times when Muslims would pull up to the masjid with their girlfriends in the car. It's like, you married? No, I'm not married. Inshallah, we're going to get married in a couple of weeks. Yeah, but you're pulling up in Jumwa with, with your intended. Like, I'm, I'm really just trying to figure that out. It's just a level of ignorance that I will never understand. It's a level of ignorance that I will never understand. No, it's not something that was a norm before Islam. It is a norm in Islam amongst American Muslims. It is a norm amongst American Muslims. Don't say that this is pre-Islamic behavior that has been carried over into Islam. La wallahi, because Islam makes it very clear from the very beginning that this is haram. No one can say that they converted to Islam and they didn't know that sleeping with someone, putting your private part in the private part of somebody else without legal right to do so is haram. Because even if you were a Christian, you knew it was wrong. This is universally wrong. It's not just Islam made it haram. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not Islam, you know. Uh, intending, uh, that's a word that we made up. I'm still waiting for the Dalil on that. For all the people who say, I'm astray, you know, I'm off it. 
I'm still waiting for the Dalil that it's okay to call a woman that you've proposed to, your intendant, and that you can sleep with her, ride around in a car alone with her, and that you can do all of these things with her because she's your intendant. So I'm, you know, but Shadi Muhammad is astray. I'm astray. Don't listen to me. You know what I mean? But meanwhile, I'm calling you guys, I'm calling the Muslim community out on things that they're doing that I still haven't received any Dalil for. And this stuff is prevalent everywhere. Everywhere. But when I was the imam, Muslims would pull up to the masjid. I would see with my own eyes, pull up to the masjid with your girl. And she got on a hijab. You got on a thobe. And y'all pulling up for Jumu'ah to, you know, engage in an act of ibadah, worship. But you pulling up haram. <laughs> I'm really trying to figure that out. When did that be? When did that become Okay. You know, and nobody says anything about it. They're intended, mashallah. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm sitting over here scratching my head like, well, what in the world? Like, when did that become okay? And I'm sorry for the, for the, for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will never accept that. That will never be okay in my book, ever. I will never accept that. You watered down Muslims who watered down Islam only because you are knee deep in the haram and you try to assuage your own conscience about the haram things that you are engaging in. Wallah Allah as long as Allah gives me breath, as long as my heart pumps blood and my back is erect, you will never make me accept that. In the words of my man, my son, ain't no curving in my vertebrae. No curving in my vertebrae. Sorry. I will never accept that as okay. I will never accept that as part of something that Islam sanctioned. And as long as I have a platform and I have a voice, I will always call this stuff out. Always. You can hate me because you don't want to hate you. But at the same token, I'm not the problem. You are. You just hate me for saying it. I had a conversation with my man Hassan yesterday. And he said, you know, Shadid, it's not, it's not you that people dislike. It's your truth. <laughs> people might not like you, but you are not the main issue that people have a problem with. It's your truth. And so when my truth intersects or overlaps with your falsehood, we're going to always run into a problem. And I'm okay. I can take my lumps. As you can see, for years, uh, the Muslim community has beat me down for years. Some of you guys listening right now, the only reason why you agree with me, the only reason why you're listening to me is because right now, I'm saying something that you agree with. The moment I say something that you disagree with, we now become arch enemies. And I'm okay with that because I have not wavered. My message has been the same since 2003, since I opened my mouth and started giving public lectures. My message has been the same since then. I have not flip-flopped. <laughs> there has been no inconsistency in my preaching since 2003. It's 2019. You do the math. Everything that I am preaching right now is the same thing that I have been preaching 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It has not changed. The same message. So you can, you know, be in your feelings about something that I said. You know, let me help you with that. It's okay. You can hate me now. All right. You can hate me now. It's okay. But that is not going to change my truth. I don't care. As Allah says in the Quran, Kul mutu fi ghaydikum, die, perish in your rage. It ain't going to change nothing. Bi'idhnillah, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not going to change nothing. So, inshallah ta'ala, we'll stop here. Um, since I was supposed to do Monday and Wednesday, I couldn't do it yesterday. I just got back from Atlanta. I was tired, exhausted, needed time with my family. Um, I'll Finish the last two tomorrow, inshallah. At the same time, I'll finish the last two and we'll be done with uh, emotional baggage. Jazakumullah khairan. You guys have been great as always. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. May Allah allow the information that we share with one another today to be uh, something that will open the minds and the hearts of those who are listening. Bi idhnillah. Wa jazakum Allahu khayran. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslimin kathira. Wa akhiru da'wana. Anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.